What's up guys, it's Hunter Sitchi from CheckShotPoker.com and the title of today's video is Opening Ranges. So I chose to do this video because many of my students have come to me asking for default preflop ranges and I'd like to discuss the ranges I use and how I alter them based on game dynamics. So today we're going to discuss 1. Why we open preflop, 2. The default ranges that we should use with that info, 3. How we can change these ranges to create more profit, and 4. How I developed these preflop ranges to begin with. So with that being said, let's just jump into our discussion. So typically the first session that I coach a student, I start by introducing myself and my coaching style. And then I try to get to know my student. So how long has he been playing? What stakes does he play? What experience level does he have? What's he trying to learn? What are his long-term goals for poker? And after I'm done with all of that, I usually like to start my first session by asking a very simple question. What is your opening range under the gun in a nine-handed game? And they usually respond by saying something like tens plus ace, king, and ace, queen. And I don't really have a problem with that. I can totally work with an under the gun range that looks like that. But then I ask the setup question. What does your under the gun limping range look like? And this is where things start to unravel for the vast majority of my students. They usually say something like deuces through nines, five four suited plus, suited broadways. Depending on how much coaching they need, suited aces, suited gappers. Then things really start to fall apart when they tell me that they're limping with offsuit broadways. And occasionally I, I see a guy that's limping with worse than offsuit broadways and sometimes offsuit aces. And this is why they come to me for coaching because I can clean all this up in like an hour and save them thousands of dollars over the course of their poker careers. Essentially, you need to eliminate all of this and I'm going to explain why. So if you're open limping under the gun, you're basically splitting your under the gun continuous range in two, and it's divided between very strong hands that you're raising with and much weaker hands that you're either limp calling or limp folding with. And there's nothing wrong with doing this against weak opposition because they don't pay attention to the ranges that you're using and they're not willing to adjust to exploit you. But as you move up in stakes, limping with a range like this can be a huge detriment to your game because good players immediately recognize a flaw in your preflop strategy. And the flaw is very simple. Your range is divided between very strong hands that connect with dry boards very well and very weak hands that only really connect with boards that are coordinated and tend to be low boards. So what happens is that on all of the random dry boards that come off, they can simply isolate you and get you to check fold a tremendous portion of the time. And what ends up happening is that your check calling range is very weak and very exploitable and all they have to do is apply a little bit of pressure to generate quite a bit of profit from you. And then some of my students try to counter by saying that they have implied odds. So they said that they limp small pocket pairs trying to flop a set and stack their opponents. And what they don't realize is that it's very difficult to generate profit when you have multiple things working against you. So first of all, you're out of position. Secondly, you don't have the initiative. You don't have a card edge against your opponent's range. And if you have a skill edge, it's significantly minimized or non-existent because of the other three factors. And even when you do flop a set, which will occur about 12% of the time, it doesn't mean that your opponent has connected with the board in any way so that you can generate profit from him. So the, altogether, this is a situation that I try to avoid as much as possible. And instead, I try to merge all of my range into strictly an open raising range or an open folding range. So under the gun, I like to use a range that looks like this. It has enough small pocket pairs in it that it has board coverage down to seven high flops. And it also has broadways in it so that I can connect with higher boards as well. 
And overall, it's been very effective for me over the course of my professional career. And I expand it based on table dynamics that we're going to get into later in this video. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about two other mistakes that I see my students making. So the first one is that some of them try to balance their limp calling and limp folding range with a limp raising range. And that limp raising range usually looks something like aces and kings. And this is even worse than just opening and limp calling because it splits your range in three and now it makes your first two ranges even more off balance. So you've got an opening range that doesn't include aces or kings. So there's certainly a lot more error on certain boards with this range because you only have queens and jacks as over pairs. And then there's also still a ton of weak hands in your limping range and they're not really anywhere close to balance if you're only limping with aces and kings. Now other students try to limp raise with maybe aces, kings, and ace king and then they throw in an occasional bluff with like a small suited ace or a small suited connector. Again this isn't nearly enough limp raising to balance for all of the other weak hands that they're limping with. So altogether, this is just a terrible range and it's really hard to keep track of and I don't really think there's even a way that you could balance all of this. You really have to consolidate your whole range into one open raising range and just stick with that. And this leads us to the other problem that I see students having. They open to different sizes with different parts of their range. So they'll, they'll use a good range like this, but they'll open to 6x with queens plus, and they'll open to 3x with the rest of their ranges. Or other times they'll open really big with jacks because they don't like playing jacks post flop, and they'll open to a normal size with the rest of their hands. You really need to avoid all of that again use the same opening range and consolidate your whole range into that and use the same opening size for the entirety of this range. It adds a ton of balance to your game and it's also very difficult to determine which part of your range you happen to be using on any given circumstance. With that being said, let's move on to the rest of my range. So it goes without saying that the closer we are to the button, the more hands we should be opening with. So like I said, I use an under the gun range of something like sevens plus, ace queen offsuit plus, and ace king. And I usually end up adding ace queen offsuit if I think the opposition is weak, and I add small pocket pairs if there's a lot of loose action and little three betting. Then as I move on to EP2, I expand a little bit more by adding ace jack suited, ace queen offsuit, and pocket sixes. EP3 looks something like fives plus, and I also add king queen suited and ace jack offsuit. Once I get over to MP1, I'm playing all of the pocket pairs, ace jack plus, and king queen. Then as I get over to the hijack, I'm playing any two cards jacks or better, and deuces plus. Then in the cutoff on the button, my ranges start to expand dramatically. So it'll look something like 5-4 suited plus as well as any two suited cards, nines or better. Once I get onto the button, I add suited connectors, suited gappers, and suited aces. And my button range is heavily dependent on what I think of the small blind and the big blind. So if they don't 3-bet enough and they're either folding too often or calling too often and check folding too many flops, I'll expand as wide as 40 or 45%. So I'll add the double gappers, I'll add king x suited, queen x suited, I'll add all of my aces, any two cards, eight or better, and some offsuit connectors. So my, my, my range might look something like 49-50%. And it's really just, this is how you take advantage of weak players. You have default ranges that look something like this. It's very difficult to exploit regardless of what you're doing. And then you can also uh, expand to exploit weaker opposition. 
Then as you get over to the small blind, I like to open roughly 62% of the time. And this is where things get interesting because there's a program out there called Poker Snowy. It's a huge supercomputer that is basically trying to solve 100 big blind poker. And it's come up with a solution for small blind versus big blind play that looks something like this. So it uses this range and all of these hands are using some sort of limp or raise strategy. What it doesn't specify is whether you should be limp calling, limp folding, or limp raising with each component of this range. But it ends up looking something like this and Poker Snowy is basically saying that it has a game theory optimal solution for 100 big blind poker out of the small blind. These are the hands that it's using. Okay, I adjust a little bit toward suited hands because I'm not a computer and I don't know how to implement Poker Snowy's strategy. My small blind range looks something like this and I'm opening with all of these hands and then I also probably 4-bet more often than I should because I don't really see anybody that is reacting to my 4-bets appropriately. So this is what my raising range looks like out of the small blind. I'm never really limping. I hate having to limp call or limp fold. I really don't ever want to be out of position without the initiative. And uh, that's why I choose to add suited connectors and all of these other suited hands to my opening range so that I can continue to be aggressive on a variety of flops. Then if I get over to the big blind, it in order for me to be raising from the big blind, I have to have limpers involved in the hand. And my big blind raising range is usually going to look something like tens plus, ace, queen plus. And it obviously varies depending on how many limpers there are and what their tendencies are. So if they like to limp raise big hands, I might shrink this a little bit. If they limp call a ton, I might shrink this or expand it depending on what I think they're going to do post flop. But this is kind of my default range for raising out of the big blind. There are also certain game types where I would expand this dramatically to any two cards that I feel comfortable going post flop with because I just think people are limp folding way too often and they just need to be punished for it. So I might raise it up to 8 or 9x preflop and just expect to take down all the limps. It's pretty much exactly the same as a squeeze play. There's just less money in the pot. So this is kind of the default range of hands that I'm using, the default actions that I'm using first into the pot. And now I want to explain how I developed these numbers and kind of the, the information that I used to create these ranges. So I've pretty much read everything that everyone else has to say about preflop ranges. And I've looked at simulations done by computers like Poker Snowy. I've also looked at some databases of friends that I have that are consistent winners online. And all the ranges look pretty close to the ranges that I just gave you. It's important to not get caught up in the cusp of ranges. So for instance, if we go over to the cutoff and we're trying to decide whether we should open some of the weaker hands in our range like Jack-10 offsuit, Queen-10 offsuit, and King-10 offsuit. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter because they either add up to a fraction of a big blind profit or a fraction of a big blind loss. And if they are a small loss, I'm generally going to be okay with that because it's probably going to produce more action for our bigger hands like Jacks Plus and Ace King. So I'm not really worried about that. If it's on the cusp, you can argue either way. These are just hands that I would be playing as a default and I'll adjust them accordingly depending on a bunch of different game factors like the players to my left and if whether or not the, the blinds are fish. So these are kind of the ranges that I'm going to use. And, and now I'd like to do kind of a Poker's 1% Ed Miller analysis of how these ranges develop. So if we picked an arbitrary number for hands that we should be playing out of the small blind and we worked in reverse order, what would happen? So let's, let's just pick an arbitrary number and say that we should be playing about 60% of hands from the small blind and coming in with all of them as a raise.
what would happen if we divided this number by the players remaining in the hand and we just ignored the, the big blind? So if we added the button, that would be two remaining players in the hand. If we ignore the big blind, what would happen? Then we take 60% and divide it by two, it would end up being roughly 30%, which is pretty close to the suggestion that I gave. This gives us room to expand our range a little bit if we think that our opposition is a little bit weak. So it ends up getting pretty close to 30% if we, if we just expand a little bit. Then if we move over to the cutoff, it would be 60% divided by the three remaining players ignoring the big blind. And 60% uh, divided by three is 20%. Again, it's very close. 60% divided by four in the hijack is 15%. Very close. Again, it's a little bit less than 15% because of our positional disadvantage. Then if we go over to MP1, it would be about 12%. We're at 10.7 with this range. EP3 is 60% divided by six, and we're at 9% instead of 10%. So again, it's just a little bit tighter because of our positional disadvantage. So this is kind of a formula that I use, and I, I think it's pretty interesting and pretty accurate. Just take an arbitrary number like 60%, which is pretty much what Poker Snowy is saying that we should open from the small blind. And then you just divide it by the players remaining left in the hand, ignoring the big blind. And that's kind of the, the range that we should be using. How you tailor that range doesn't really matter. It should be your, your big hands and then the hands on the cusp like ace-jack offsuit and, and king-queen are debatable. It doesn't matter which one that you add. They're, again, they're just a small fraction of a profit or a small fraction of a big blind loss. And uh, ultimately, it isn't going to play a huge role in your range. So that's kind of what I do pre-flop. Now let's talk about isolation ranges and kind of talk about big blind defense a little bit so that I can give you a, a full video here. So as a default, I open to four or five X and one two no limit three or four X in two five no limit, and then usually three X or 2.5 X in five ten no limit. And the reason for the differences in sizes just really has to do with the average flatting range of my opponents. So the smaller the stakes you're playing, the more likely players are to flat with extremely weak ranges, which means that overall your range is going to be significantly stronger than theirs, and they're not going to adjust based on your sizing. So as a result, you should raise a little bit bigger and go get some extra value for yourself. Then as you move up in stakes, people are going to adjust to the sizes that you're using pre-flop and you should shrink it a little bit because you don't really need that big of a raise to be generating the kind of fold equity that you're looking for against the small blind and big blind if they're playing correctly. So th then that leads us to the question of how much we should increase our size if somebody limps in in front of us. So I usually like to just add one big blind per limper as a default and then adjust based on how bad I think they are. So there are certain players that like to limp fold a lot, which really just boggles my mind. I don't see the point in limping in if I'm not intending to limp call. I don't limp anyway, so I suppose it doesn't really matter. And uh, then there are other players that basically limp call 100% of the time. And against them, you should use a much larger size, whether you're raising with value hands or bluffs, because if you're raising with a value hand, you'd like to set up a pot geometry so that you can play for stacks by the river if a favorable flop comes up. And if you're raising as a bluff, you prefer to make a larger pot so that you can uh, pick up a larger pot on the flop or the turn against such an inherently weak range. So again, remember that you're, you're not really adjusting your size based on the strength of your cards, you're adjusting it more off of the type of opponent that you're playing against. So as a default, again, I, I raise it to one big blind more than my standard pre-flop raise. So if I'm playing 2-5 and someone limps in in front of me, I'm probably going to isolate to 25. Now, what kind of range am I going to use to isolate my opponents? If there's one limper in front of me and I have no reason to suspect that he's going for a limp raise, I'm just going to use the exact same range of hands. So if somebody limps in from EP1, I'm going to use my EP2 range. If somebody limps in from EP2, I'm going to use my 
EP3 range to isolate. If there's one limp right from me, it's going to look exactly the same as my opening range, unless I have reason to suspect that he's going for a limp race. At that point, I tailor my range and it's usually going to shrink a bit. So now what happens if multiple players start limping in in front of me? Obviously we need to shrink our range a bit because it's more likely that the hand is going to go multi-way and it's also more likely that we're going to get limp raised. So as a default without any information on my opponents, I'm going to use a multi-way isolation range of something like ace plus and ace queen plus. I might also add ace jack and king queen. It's really just dependent on what I think my opponents are going to do post-flop. So I, I might shrink this, I might expand it. It might evolve into a situation like I was talking about out of the big blind where multiple limpers are limp folding so often that I'm really just expanding my range to include anything that I feel comfortable going post-flop with just because I think they're folding so much. So some of my students have sweated me this year and they've wondered why I was isolating to such a huge size and then they see me end up showing down 6-4 suited. And it's because I'm just assuming that my the opponents that I'm in the hand against are limp folding too often and I'm just exploiting that. If I have to go post flop, I do and I'd prefer to have a hand that's suited so that I can continue with my aggression a decent amount of the time. So now that I've kind of described my isolation ranges, you might be wondering what my over limping ranges look like. And I'd like to start by saying that I very rarely open limp, and if I do, it's only going to be from the cutoff or the button. I'm never going to put myself in a situation where I know that I'm going to have to limp call. And the majority of the situations where I am over limping, I'm pretty certain that I'm never going to have to limp call. So that being said, there are certain situations where I'm going to over limp, and this is one of them, where two or three limpers are in front of me and I have a hand that I don't necessarily want to isolate with, but it's certainly a hand that plays well multi-way. So, and I'm also in position. So hands like seven, six suited, ace, deuce suited, king, 10 suited, and small pocket pairs would all kind of fall into the category of hands that I would consider over limping with here. Now, some people say that they don't agree with over limping here. You should either be isolating or folding and not split your range in half like we talked about doing under the gun. And they're right to a certain extent, but my contention is that if EP1, EP3, and the hijack are all going to make such big mistakes where one of the three of them should have isolated at or raised at some point, if they're going to make big mistakes like that, you're allowed to also play outside of a, an optimal strategy in order to exploit that. And I think that you'd be leaving value on the table if you don't over limp in the spot with a hand like 7-6 suited. Now, there might also be situations where you could go for a big isolation raise and try and go for a steal. But that's certainly very situational. And as a default, I would be okay with you over limping here, especially if the small blind and big blind are players that aren't very aggressive and aren't actively targeting players that are limp folding too often. So with that being said, let me kind of just highlight a range of hands that I would be over limping with here on the button. So in order of preference, my over limping range would include all pocket pairs I don't feel comfortable raising. So something like eights through deuces. It would also include many suited connectors and these would go all the way up into the broadways that I don't feel comfortable isolating with. I would also add suited aces because they allow you to flop the nut flush draw, which is very important in multi-way pots, especially when stacks are deep. I might also include suited gappers if stacks are very deep. And if my opponents are truly terrible, I'll add hands like king nine suited, queen nine suited, and double gappers. The hands that I try and avoid are the weaker broadways that I'm not isolating with. These are very difficult to play even when you're in position because a lot of times 
if players are limping way too much in front of you, it's because they're including hands that they should really always be raising. So hands like ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, king-queen. If these hands are included in your opponent's limping range, then you certainly don't want to include smaller broadways in your range because it's just putting you in a situation where you can flop top pair and you'll feel obligated to give a street or two of action when you're most likely behind and you're just not really getting yourself in a situation where you can exert any sort of aggression like you could with suited hands that I highlighted earlier. So these are all of the things that I'm kind of considering on the button before I do anything and uh, I hope that that kind of clarifies over limping for you a bit. So to recap, we discussed why you shouldn't be open limping preflop, and we discussed a few situations where you can get away with over limping in late position. We also talked about open raising ranges and open raising sizes that you can use. We discussed some of the factors involved in expanding those ranges and changing those sizes so that you can make more money. And then we transitioned into a discussion on isolation ranges and some of the factors that go into being successful in those situations. So hopefully I answered some of the questions that you guys have been asking me. And if you have any others, feel free to go over to my website, checkshoppoker.com, and shoot me an email. I'll happily clarify any of the things that I mentioned in this video. Also make sure that you follow my website at Check Shover on Twitter. I'm giving away three $1,500 seats to the Millionaire Maker next summer at the WSOP, and all you have to do is follow and retweet to qualify. So as always, I'm Hunter Sitchi. Make sure that you run good, have fun, and constantly look for ways to improve.